I'm really pleased to welcome you to this webinar, uh, Facing Precarity, Envisioning Careers in 2020 and Beyond, um, part of a uh, brief fall uh, seminar series on um, Asian studies and beyond um, in the pandemic age. This uh, seminar series is sponsored by the Kogut Institute um, and partic in particular, it's 21st century PhD series um, initiative and also the um, China initiative of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs here at Brown University and um, supported by the, um, the Department of East Asian Studies and its wonderful staff. So I want to thank them very much for their support. In this um, session today, we're going to be um, looking at um, a, a set of, inter, uh, of intertwined questions um, that start from the question of what are um, resources for graduate students and recent um, graduates who are emerging into a collapsed um, job market, both within and outside of academia um, in this um, time. What kinds of skills and experiences should scholars in global Asian studies and other fields who have been reliant on a heretofore ro comparatively robust academic hiring adopt from extant programs and peers in other fields? What are differences in hiring and work cultures um, inside and outside the United States? What should degree holder, how should degree holders prepare themselves for possible immigration and work restrictions in an age of economic austerity? And what are some ways um, that um, holders of PhDs and other graduate degrees have adapted their careers to shifting personal, intellectual, and economic circumstances? Um, I am uh, Rebecca Nadostup. I am an pro associate professor of history and East Asian studies and, and here at Brown. And from tw uh, 2016 to 2019, I was also director of graduate studies in history. Uh, I'm going to be um, co-hosting and co-moderating this panel with my colleague, Jeffrey Moser, who is Assistant Professor of History and Art and Architecture at Brown, and also Director of Undergraduate Studies. Uh, his research focuses on the ways in which sensory engagement with material things transformed historical approaches to the challenges of making, reasoning, and knowing. He is currently completing a book manuscript entitled Nominal Things, Bronzes, Schemata, and the Hermeneutics of Facture in Northern Song, China, which examines the ways in which the rediscovery and systematic cataloging of archaic bronzes disrupted classical hermeneutics and the fracture of ritual forms. We'll alternate in presenting a number of uh, questions to our panelists, sometimes in toto and sometimes um, individually. And if um, the audience has questions, follow-up questions or other questions, you're welcome to submit them via the Q&A function. Um, you can submit them with your name and affiliation. You can submit them anonymously. Um, but Professor Moser will be monitoring that Q&A. And um, at the end of uh, the session, ho hopefully we'll leave 20 minutes or half an hour um, to uh, answer those questions, um, possibly not all individually, um, we may not have time for that, but um, in collated form, especially if common themes emerge. Um, so feel free to submit questions via that function. Um, and now I'm very pleased to, um, to introduce our roundtable speakers. John Paul Christie is here with us from the American Council of Learned Societies, where he is senior director. He helps maintain and enhance the council's peer review processes while also developing and implementing new fellowship and grant programs with special focus on programs that highlight the public dimensions of humanity scholarship. Um, as director, he frequently represents ACLS and its work to various stakeholders in the academic and philanthropic communities and to the wider public. Uh, before joining the ACLS in 2012, he was a presidential management fellow in Washington, DC. Um, where he worked on projects relating to US public diplomacy, internet anti-censorship programs, and the public humanities. And uh, he received his PhD in classical studies from the University of Pennsylvania. 
Yape Guo is a university do, universitaire docent at the University of uh, Groningen. She specializes in China in the global context, the intellectual history of modern China, and the conceptual history of uh, religion or religion in quotation marks in East Asia. She has a number of publications on the re-encounter between Confucianism and Christianity and the changing discourse and the conception of religion in 19th century China. She was educated at the National, uh, at National Taiwan University and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She's held both faculty and research fellowship positions at Wisconsin, Tufts University, the University of Bochum, the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Religious Diversity, and Leiden University, as well as at Groningen. Heather Ruth Lee is an assistant professor of history at NYU Shanghai. Um, prior to that, she was a Mellon Humanities postdoctoral fellow at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She is a Brown alum um, from American Studies, um, and her interests are urban and legal history and the history of race and ethnicity in the United States. Her first book, Chop Suey Corridor, tells the ironic story of how federal anti-Chinese laws spurred the Chinese restaurant industry in New York City. She is also a public historian whose research has been featured in NPR, Atlantic Magazine, Gastropod, um, the Gastropod Food uh, Podcast. Um, she's advised and curated exhibitions at the New York Historical Society, the National Museum of American History, and the Museum of the Chinese in America. She's a member of the Scholar Strategy Network, an organization um, devoted to connecting the academy with policymakers, um, citizen associations, and the media. Huimin Lucia Liu is a cultural anthropologist whose research focuses on death and governance in um, today's People's Republic of China. She received her BA in journalism from the National Zhengzhou University in Taiwan, her MA and MPhil in anthropology from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, um, and her PhD in anthropology from Boston University um, in 2015. Uh, she worked as a tenure track assistant professor in the Division of Humanities at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology between 2015 and 2019. Since 2019, she has worked, uh, she's been working as a tenure track assistant professor in the sociology and anthropology department at George Mason University. Emily Swafford is the director of academic and professional affairs at the American Historical Association. Um, where she has been since September 2014. She directs several grant funded projects, including um, notably the uh, Career Diversity for Historians and History Gateways initiatives. Um, she works on issues of graduate, undergraduate and K through 12 education, as well as professional concerns for historians. She earned a BA in History and American Studies at the University of Virginia and her PhD in 20th century US history at the University of Chicago. She is a historian of the US military, US foreign relations and women's and gender history. And finally, uh, Paul Vierthaler, assistant professor of Chinese studies at William and Mary University, um, holds a PhD in, P in East Asian languages and literatures and an MA in Asian studies from Yale University. Um, he also has a BA in Chinese and political science from the University of Kansas. Prior to, co to coming to William & Mary, he was an assistant professor of the digital humanities at Leiden University um, from 2016 to 2019, where he helped establish the Leiden University Center for Digital Humanities. He also held postdoctoral fellowships at Boston College in digital humanities and Harvard, at Harvard um, in Chinese studies. His research focuses primarily in late imperial Chinese literature um, where, and his current monograph project tracks how historical information in late imperial China was transformed and deformed through novels, dramas, and unofficial histories using both traditional uh, critical analysis and computational analytics. Um, so welcome to all of you um, and I, I'm glad to give those um, extremely rich and varied introductions because I think it um, 
it's important to give a, a picture of um, the kind of roundedness of people's careers. And this is um, something that I hope that we can concentrate on and, and dig a little bit deeper into today. So I wanted to start with a question to, um, to the uh, round table as a whole. Um, and um, to link that to an acknowledgement. So I think it's important to start with this uh, acknowledgement that um, we have hundreds of new and recent PhDs who are sort of who are, have been thrown thrown into a turbulent seat. Um, as a historian, um, I kind of constitutionally shy away from these words like unprecedented. <laughs> we don't like to, you know, think that there's anything new under the sun. But I think a lot of us are struggling with the scale and number of what we're kind of facing now, and really like, you know, struggling for for concrete things to hold on to and answers, um, especially in the face of so many unknowns about so many industries, including higher education. Um, and, but on the other hand, one of the small things that we might do in the face of all this uncertainty and the scale is to, um, to talk more concretely, um, as always, about what lives and careers really look like, um, even in flusher times, and <clears throat> particularly um, uh, think of, you know, give some concreteness um, against the sort of common assumptions of what careers ought to ought to look like. There's a lot of, of um, sort of thinking about what things should look like. So I wonder if each of you could share an important moment when your life and work took a turn that you had not foreseen, either when you were in a graduate student or when in, during an earlier moment in your career. Um, and um, and you know, sort of where things went from there. One moment that um, I think stands out to me was in graduate school. I had uh, taken a few years off beforehand uh, between undergraduate and graduate school to work in a number of different jobs. One of them was with the Philadelphia Orchestra as a production associate. And um, I really enjoyed, it, it showed me how much I really enjoyed team-based work. <laughs> and. Um, I was asked over the summer once to help out uh, again with their um, a tour of Asia um, that was being planned for the orchestra, mostly going to be on, my work would be on stateside and mostly arranging visas for um, the musicians. And I remember going um, up and to, to New York to go to a series of embassy <laughs> visits to, to get visas for um, the musicians and going into um, the uh, Chinese embassy or the Chinese consulate and, and, and working with um, trying to solve this problem of, of holding 150 passports in my hand that weren't mine and um, uh, trying to get uh, during a year when we were preparing for the Olympics, um, trying to get a lot of uh, uh, skeptical uh, diplom uh, diplomatic corps <laughs> service folks to, to, to stamp all of these visas. And I remember um, feeling at once sort of miserable and elated um, just because of the, the, um, this big problem, this big logistical problem that I had to, to focus on um, with the help of, my, of, of other uh, members of the team and realized I had been reading for my um, comprehensive exams the whole time <laughs> and, and thinking, what is, what's resonating more with me? And I remember thinking that um, working on big, large scale problems, projects was something that really resonated with me at that moment, even in the moment where I was sitting on a really cold floor in the consulate <laughs> waiting to be, um, uh, to, to see an official to work on, on getting these um, stamps. And that really, was this odd crystallizing moment for me of thinking more broadly about what my career could be or finding situations where I could be working with a team on big challenges. And um, I think I really changed my perspective on my career path after that um, and started looking more broadly as a, a, you know, within grad school of opportunities to, to do work outside of the academy or on bigger projects like that. And that's what led me to the Presidential Management Fellows Program after grad school. 
Thanks. And thank you, Rebecca, for organizing. It's really nice to be part of this conversation and to hear other people's experiences. And hope, hopefully this will help inspire the audience or help the audience figure out some, um, you know, whatever, uh, whatever things you're, you're thinking through that brought you here. But I guess I had a similar sort of accidental moment in which I found teamwork and um, policy making in graduate school. So um, I went to, I, I did my PhD at Brown in American Studies, and um, we have a student government body that is fairly, when, uh, when I was becoming involved, not very well run or fairly poorly attended. And um, I think I was sent as our departmental representative to one meeting, and I kind of sat around and I thought, okay, well, here's a bunch of um, ideas and a community that has, you know, issues that face specifically graduate students at Brown, but also in that moment, there were, when I was going to graduate school, there were also um, uh, um, a discussion or a, a, a revisiting of the idea of unionizing graduate students at other institutions. So there was this moment in which it felt like there was what um, uh, the student body sort of offered was a space to sort of help within Brown, think through um, uh, what are the needs of graduate students. This was a moment in which gra uh, Brown's MA programs were growing substantially. And as well as, are we sort of providing the resources that allow graduate students to uh, finish their degrees in a reasonable amount of time? So there was a discussion of time to, time to degree and whether there were enough years. So I ran for president. I um, one, because there's virtually no competition. But, but what I really appreciated out of that experience was a taste of um, management, a taste of policy making, and, and being invited to discussions at a higher level that I don't think um, I would have had any sense of uh, as a graduate student otherwise. Meeting with the deans, meeting with the president, meeting with the provost. Um, uh, so I think that gave me sort of a taste of um, a curiosity for what it meant to run um, an organization. And uh, one of the reasons why I think NYU Shanghai is a good fit for me is that as a new institution, there's a lot of things that we need to figure out as they come along. So I think that earlier experience and sort of thinking like, there seems to be a problem. I'm not quite sure what it is. I still need to learn about it. Um, and uh, working with people in different departments was a way in which, you know, I didn't have to be thinking about my coursework or I didn't have to be thinking about, um, you know, where I was in my in my PhD program, but also was deeply satisfying. And I think so now being in a faculty position for uh, four years now, uh, it's it's a big part of faculty life, the sort of collaborative administrative work. And I think it was a good preparation uh, for that. But to sort of pivot back to that question of like this moment of uncertainty, what did it open up? Um, for me, it was important to know that I had an appetite and a set of skills and experiences that would be translatable to multiple environments. Um, I knew that, you know, um, American studies is not a growing field. I, you know, I ended up in a history position, but there were those things I was thinking about as I was going on the market. You know, I gave myself a certain amount of time. If, that didn't happen, you know, I can find a job in which I would use my skills, maybe not the knowledge exactly that I cultivated, but a cer certain set of skills that I would want to translate or would be interested in uh, cultivating in a, in a career move. So, um, you know, I think that was, that was, that was both an opportunity and as well as a sense of comfort for when, um, you know, entering the job market, it doesn't matter whether it's flush or, 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 uh, you know, or scarce, it's, there's a lot of uncertainty. And I think that, yeah, that was how I dealt with the, um, the uncertainty of the situation. Hi, everybody. And thanks also again to Rebecca for organizing this. Um, this opening question, I think for me was, a little bit difficult to think about because there have been a lot of moments throughout my career where things could have gone one way or another and they didn't have to end up as as they did and it kind of was a lot of different contingencies that came together to 
you know, lead me to where I am right now. And, you know, I think of moments about deciding to go to graduate school. I had been living in China for a few years, not really sure what I wanted to do with my life, deciding to do a PhD, you know, going to Europe because I taught at Leiden for three years and then returning to the States. There are all, all sorts of moments that kind of were formed by a lot of negotiations between myself, between my partner, where we wanted to go with our lives. And so in the end, I kind of think there's one defining moment in graduate school that sent me off on the path that has led to this right now. And I was at a point in my fourth year where, you know, I had gone through my qualifying exams, my prospectus had been passed, and I had a chapter written. And I sat down with my advisor after this chapter had been written. Uh, and it was an okay chapter, you know, just your standard sort of literary PhD thing. Uh, and I was talking about how people talked about the eunuch Wei Zhongxian in Chinese fiction of the late imperial period. And we sat down together and we said, okay, well, here's a good place to start, but what, what do we do now? Like, how do I move on from this place? And we got to kind of just talking about general interests. And, you know, I talked a little bit about interest in technology, interest in, uh, you know, computers and these sorts of things. And prior to this, I had absolutely no experience with programming. I hadn't really even heard of the digital humanities and I just wasn't sure what to do. But I had read, in, as part of my qualifying exam, a book by um, a Pedigree called The Book in the Renaissance. And there's a small little segue in it where he talks about using library union catalogs for you know, getting at the grubby little books that have been pushed off into small libraries all around the world. And I thought, well, this is something interesting that I can use to study how you know, these books that I'm interested in have kind of exploded across time. And I thought, well, what if I look at online library catalog records? And so we decided I should try to leverage this interest in technology that I have into studying um, you know, into digital things, right? So to get at this data, I started to have to develop a lot of skills about, you know, licensing agreements and I had to learn to program and I had to do all sorts of things that led me into a completely different space than what I expected as somebody working on a literary PhD. And what ended up happening is I got very, very into kind of the computational aspects of things. And this put me into conversations with people in computer science programs and linguistics programs and in industry. And so this really opened up a much larger space than I had really considered prior to this. And so once I really got into this, and as I was starting to think about what I wanted to do after my PhD, um, the field was a little more open than I had, and than it probably would have been otherwise, where I wasn't just looking for jobs on the traditional academic track, um, even though that is where I ended up going, I was also looking at positions as, you know, data scientists, and as, you know, just kind of your, you know, run of the run of the line programmer at a tech company and these sorts of things. And I think that choice to really dive into this opened up a lot of doors that I never would have really recognized without it. And, you know, it's, it's just one of those many moments that could have gone one way and just happened to go the way that it did. Hello, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. And one of the things I've missed in in this unfolding pandemic has been hearing other people's stories and meeting new people. And so I'm, I'm so pleased to, to be here on this panel and to, to be hearing from so many other interesting people. Uh, thank you for Rebecca and, and Jeffrey for organizing this and, and running this. So the story that I wanted to tell is, I was trying to think about how it would resonate with people right now who are facing you know, things that we didn't choose. And so I wanted to maybe talk a little bit about a moment when I tried really hard and didn't get what I wanted and what happened instead. So uh, when I was finishing my PhD at the University of Chicago, I was doing everything you do when you're finishing and you're not quite sure what you can do. I was applying to academic jobs. I was applying to postdocs. I was applying to academic jobs in all sorts of different fields. I was applying to government jobs. Um, and I was just sort of trying to figure out what I could do. You know, I was sort of down to the, I just would like someone to pay me, you know, like that's, that's where I was. 
Um, and I had, you know, I had some sort of successes. I uh, applied for and, and flew to Berlin for an interview for a, a postdoc, a multi-year postdoc that would allow me to work on another project. I was really excited. Um, I didn't get that postdoc. I was given a short-term fellowship that took me to DC, which I thought, okay, that's a great place for me and my research interests. Uh, there's a lot, I figured that uh, uh, Washington DC was a good place to have a PhD and be looking for work, which is true. Um, and I moved here and then this institution that I had this short-term fellowship with, they uh, had another opening for another long-term fellowship. And I said, okay, great, I'm here. They know me now, you know, like I can apply and I'll be even more, I know I've been through it. So I did the whole thing again. Um, and I was a finalist and I interviewed again. Um, and in the meantime, you know, because I knew that wasn't certain, I had been applying for other things and, and networking and, and uh, my now boss, it, had, it turned out they had just decided they needed to hire into a position. And so we had this exchange as I was applying for this fellowship saying, you know, oh, well, that sounds like a great position, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a fellow, I'm a finalist for this fellowship. I'm not, I'm not sure that I, you know, will be able to apply for this job and, you know, uh, saying, you know, so sorry. Um, but I, I was a finalist. I interviewed. And then I was called up to the director's office and the director said to me, and I think it's important to know that, the, well, the director said to me, you know, Emily, any other year, it would have been you, but this year you were three out of four. There were four finalists and I remember thinking, okay. And so I sat in that, I sat in that office, I negotiated another year of affiliation with the Institute because I wasn't sure what my job was going to be. I went down to my office in the Institute. I cried and I emailed my now boss and said, I will be applying to that position. And so that is a moment when things went really not the way I wanted them to go. You know, I had worked really hard to do other things. I, I wasn't committed to doing research, but I, I was interested in it and I worked, I worked really hard for it. Um, but now the job that I have, the job I was hired into and the job that it has become has been really fulfilling and, I, and it was the right choice for me, but it came out of a moment when things were not going my way and I was not, I was feeling a real lack of ability to shape my life, even though I had done thinking about what I wanted and what I wanted my career to look like and what I wanted my life to look like, it felt like I still had options that were closing down. Um, so e even, even without a global pandemic, those moments can happen in careers. I think particularly in PhD careers because you do have specialized skills and you, you have very precise interests. And sometimes uh, that, that the translation of those into something else that maybe doesn't know how to understand what you've been training to do um, can, can be challenging. Everybody else, I'm also very uh, grateful to be here to share some of my experience. And um, so if I have to pick one uh, import important moment in my life, uh, which I had not uh, pre uh, uh, foreseen, I'll probably say uh, it's like uh, at the end of uh, 2014, when I got the offer from uh, Groningen University uh, and uh, to kind of join uh, or to take my uh, current position. And uh, that was a surprising moment because uh, I had never uh, expected how this negotiation between uh, life and career would pan out in this manner. Um, before that moment or before that job offer, I actually went through a couple years of uh, uh, extremely uh, precarious life. Uh, I had several uh, fellowship and uh, adjunct positions after I moved to the Netherlands, but I could not find a permanent position. And in between, I actually spent a lot of time uh, staying home, try to be full-time housewife and to look after my daughter. I think before she turned three, I uh, was a full-time mother for her. And uh, so before I got that offer, I uh, was very, very close. I already started to uh, get together with a group of friends uh, to think about how do we uh, open a, a 
a family cafe in the city of Leiden, you know, just completely ready to do a career change. And then I got the, um, the offer. And um, why is it so important or so uh, surprising when I look back? Uh, I would say when I was a, a graduate student or in my early career, I always knew that uh, the compromise or the negotiation between life and career will be a big challenge for me or for a lot of us. And I think it is still a challenge. And But I always imagine this kind of negotiation in terms of either or. So uh, I don't know whether it is particularly related to the fact that I am a woman. I always imagine that uh, the academic career is that you either have it or you don't have it. So I was always very, very afraid of compromising on that. So I was always worried if I put it in in a secondary place in my life, I will lose it. Or if I have an interruption in my career, I will never be able to get back to it. And when I got that job offer, the most surprising thing, and that's also most kind of unexpected is thing was, I actually was completely almost cut off my any hope or any possibility of continuing my academic career, yet I was offered this opportunity to go back and to go back full time. And I think uh, for me, that was something I totally did not uh, expect. And uh, also I think that made me rethink about this uh, negotiation in real life, how life career um, combination and negotiation, I think I have kind of a new uh, new perspective and new insight into it. Yeah, thank you. And I'm going to pass that to uh, Hui Ming. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca, for uh, inviting me here uh, to talk about uh, job, my own experience with job. And I mean, I'm an, as she mentioned, I'm an anthropologist, uh, um, uh, at least for anthropology job market in the US has been bad for many years. And I, I mean, with the current situation, I just couldn't re really imagine what the situation is now. So, um, but when I was about to finish my dissertation, I know, uh, even though in, per, in my personal life, I also know the, jo the job situation was bad, but I actually didn't give much thought about changing my past, maybe because I was naive or, or I was just stubborn. So, but uh, I mean, uh, in the back of my mind, of course, I know if it didn't work out for a couple of tries, I got to, you know, think about alternative. But uh, when I was like close to finish my dissertation, I was really thinking about I want to stay in academia. And that's really the most important things to me. And I do think in retrospect that this mindset is important because I once I set up priority, then I'm flexible about where I'm willing to go. So, um, but if you, if there's a very specific place you really want to be, like if you really want to be in East Coast, if you really want to just be in Boston or something, then you might have to think about the alternative career path just to maximize your chance. So, so the the biggest, uh, the most unexpected thing for me really is to teach in Hong Kong. <laughs> so Rebecca mentioned that I'm actually not from Hong Kong, but I did my master in Hong Kong. I went to Hong Kong in 2003, right after SARS's crisis. And then I left Hong Kong in 2006. And then I went to Boston, um, did my PhD. And then, you know, fast forward, you know, the time when I was, you know, ready to kind of go on job market um, and, uh, um, 
like kind of like an Emily story. Like I apply a lot of things. I apply poster. Uh, I apply like a, a faculty position in US. Um, Although the first time I went on job market as ABD, I really only applied job in US, but like like all kind of things and like in 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 many places all over the America, in, in all over the United States, and and we can talk about that later. But I mean, applying job as ABD, you are really in a big disadvantage position. But the only good thing coming out from that experience, that first year experience, is I had the the application package material ready. So when I was about to actually defend my dissertation, kind of really go on job market again, um, and that's like my second year try, uh, I, uh, had, I already kind of had a draft up for everything. And you know, it's kind of like writing research paper, the more you revise, eventually all those documents will become better. So um, I, uh, I went on job market like the second time or kind of the real run. Uh, in, in, in fall 2014. Um, and I kind of also defend my dissertation around that time, the beginning of the semester. So um, the Hong Kong, so I, my first tenure track job was at HKUST, uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And their deadline, that application actually was the very first application I put out for that academic uh, year. So, and their deadline, I remember it's like in the end of August, like who has such a early deadline? And the only, the only reason I could like get put out in applications because I already had my previous value or experience, but I have all the drafted there. So, you know, I can put out an application on time. So I did, so I put out an application for that job among other things um, in, in, um, in, in the end of um, August and then by October, they told me that uh, they asked me if like I actually already defend my dissertation, and then if I did, then they want to fly me over for a campus visit. So, um, so then I went to do campus visit in um, early December, something like that. And then uh, in the end of December, when I was in North Carolina with my in-law for Christmas break. I actually got my second campus visit invite, um, and it's actually a university in North Carolina, um, public university system. Um, it's a tier two campus. So the university is actually in a mountain area. It's not an ideal location. And uh, um, so, but I was just, you know, feel very excited about the second uh, second campus visit invite. And then I did my uh, campus visit in mid January and, uh, um, and then in the end, I got the offer from them. That's my first offer, um, basically three weeks later. So I was so excited. And uh, um, uh, I really, I thought I would take that job. But at that time, because that was like really my first time, oh, and it's my second year try, but it's really like kind of the my first experience of doing campus visit and like receiving offer and you know and trying I also have my partner is also in academia I was you know trying to navigate how I can do spousal hire and all these things and then so I decide I really want to push for the HKUST for an answer so you know I was thinking you know if I can get a second another offer maybe I can talk to the North Carolina University say you know maybe they they are willing to do spousal hire and so on. But then it turned out that um, luckily, like I got the, the offer from HKUST as well. So now I had a really lucky dilemma. So uh, should I take the North Carolina job with a sweet, sweet teaching law and that's after course reduction and living in a mountain where the next university is two hour drive and it will be an issue if you have like you have family member need to take into consideration, or should I take the HKUST job? So the normal teaching though there was three for the whole academic year, but as a junior faculty, I got even I got course reduction. So it's only I only need to teach two courses per academic year. That basically means the first three years I have one semester I can be on leave. It's crazy amount, uh, this is the amount of teaching load is really very little. And then, um, and you know, Hong Kong's a mega city with eight public funded university and 
to be honest, their the salary at HKUST is like 60% higher than the North Carolina one. But it was all the thing on the table. I actually thought I was still leaning toward to take the North Carolina job because I want to stay in the US. That's one thing. And then I really like people there. So how should I do? And then I start talking to people, um, to talk to my mentors. And then um, it turned out all of them, including my supervisor, Robert Weller at Boston University, all of them told me, you should take an HKUST job. I said, why? I mean, but I want to stay in academia in US. Why, why do all of you think I should take the Hong Kong job? Like, can I come back to US market? Like, like is it possible? Like, but then all three point at the same factor that they say, um, because the teaching load is so low in Hong Kong, you, you, I mean, unless you want to settle in a mountain in North Carolina for life, or if you want to stay in Hong Kong for life, if you're thinking about you want to have a career change in the future in academia, publication is the key. And with that much teaching low, you could not, it's, I mean, some people did and they are amazing, but it's just really, really hard to put out enough publication um, to go on job market with this kind of market. So I was kind of stunned when all of them told me I should take the Hong Kong job. So I said, okay, if actually all three of them say that, then I just, well, plus the pay is higher. <laughs> so, and, and I did have some connection with Hong Kong because I did master there. So it's not a like really strange place for me, even though the, uh, I was a student versus professor this time. So anyway, so I did, and then, um, that was the really unexpected thing. Really at the last minute, I thought I would take the North Carolina job, but then in the end, I kind of um, changed my mind. And then in retrospect, I think it all worked out as what I had planned. Like in the four years in Hong Kong, I really didn't teach much. And that gave me time to you know, have enough publication in the pipeline and got my book manuscript ready. So last, in 2018, I went on job market again and with specific idea that I want to be in the US and ideally I want to be somewhere closer to a big city. And then then now I'm at George Mason University. So so just for those of you who, you know, if you are, I, I don't know, I think my story is the kind of, it's not idea, it's not what I want to do, but in the end, it all work out the way it just, you kind of, sometimes you have to kind of look far ahead, like look beyond the immediate consequences. And then of course it's gambling. It might not work, but sometimes it work. So that's my story. Thank you. Thank you all so much. So we already have a, a lot of issues on the table. Um, and Jeff, if you have any follow-up questions, um, feel free to jump been or do you want to if you have anything? I think one of the things that is is really um, notable here is um, I guess is is the uh, kind of twin um, twin theme which is both um, uh, this disappointment you know, like you can work really hard and still be disappointed on the one hand. <laughs> Um, but then also this, I was really um, this kind of flexibility and particularly a part of you know, what we just heard from Kwame, Min, but also I think Yape, what you had to say was really uh, affecting and important um, for people to hear because even before um, the pandemic and the economic collapse from um, when working with, um, with uh, both faculty and graduate students in uh, career diversity programs um, or career diversity programming, it was like a really common theme that people um, or fear that people evince is is this this thought that is like <clears throat> academia of all job tracks. Like once you leave, you can never come back, um, and and this is sort of like a well, you know, like a um, a fear that is more shared than proven, perhaps at this point, and um, and so um, hearing hearing uh, you know like uh, both 
your, you know, your particular experience as a counter experience, but then also as just like a very human experience because you make choices that that are, you know, important and make sense at the time um, is really useful. But actually, I, I think that might be useful um, to turn back to Emily and John Paul because they've been like working at a at the larger level, the more institutional level on these kinds of programs um, and just ask you to, if you um, want to talk a little bit about some of the programming you've been doing around these issues and um, and maybe, maybe with an eye to like what is constant and what is changing um, in this particular year um, or as, as a result of, of the 2020 um, examples. Emily, do you wanna start? So, so the AHA has been working on this project that we call Career Diversity for Historians since 2012. Um, so we've, we've spent some time here. We've gotten three grants from the Mellon Foundation to do this work. And we've engaged with over a quarter of history granting, um, uh, history PhD granting institutions in the US. Um, and what we've been doing is we started where, with the problem or that we started where most people start, which is what do you do after your PhD? Um, realizing that not everyone who wants to be a professor is able to be a professor, not because they lack in any way, but because the skills that they bring to the academic job market at the time when they're looking for a job might not match with the needs of institutions that are hiring. Um, and trying to sort of square that, that circle of people who work really hard for something, who have lots to contribute and are stymied at the end of graduate school, what, what do I do? You know, and feeling like they maybe have taken a financial hit, maybe they've taken a personal hit, they've worked really hard and, and they feel, you know, they don't have anything to show for it. So that was, that was where we started. Um, and as we worked, as we worked um, with graduate students, as we worked with departments, we realized that 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 question was the wrong one. What do you do after is, is important, but if we want to help people not be in that position of feeling like they have no options, of feeling like they've worked really hard and they have nothing to show for it, then we actually have to start earlier. So we've, we've spent most of our time working with departments. For the past two years, we've worked really closely with 20 departments to rethink their curriculum and their culture around graduate education. Um, the Mellon Foundation is focused pretty strongly on the PhD, but the programs we've worked with have realized a lot of these issues apply to MA students as well. I think there's some MA students who are calling in today. So while I might say graduate and it might seem doctoral, it, a lot of it actually overlaps. Um, and so I just thought I would share some of the things that we have done and learned um, and really briefly, because I want to make sure that John Paul has time to talk about the work of ACLS and I want to hear um, from the other panelists as well. Uh, the, the, I think one of the big things we've done was created a data set of where, where history PhDs work, and that's online at historians.org slash where historians work, very straightforward link. Um, and that data set is really helpful because it's broken down by department, it's broken down by geography of where um, history PhDs work, by field of study, and by gender. And you can look at it and find not only the breadth of where history PhDs are working inside and outside of the academy, but also where they're working geographically. There is one slide that, that shows where uh, historians are work, PhD historians are working outside of the US. It's not quite as interactive as we would have liked it to be, um, but I encourage you to take a look at that. It's really helpful for thinking about, for noticing the, uh, the slide that I like to pay mo most attention to is not only, well, I guess there's two. One is there's, we call it the bubble slide that shows just the enormous breadth of where people are working outside of the academy. So there's really no good answer to, well, you know, the academic track seems to have a clear set of steps, which I would argue is not as, not as clear as it appears to be, um, of, you know, but what do I do otherwise? And there's just so many options that you really have to spend the time thinking about what you want to do. Um, the other slide that I really like in that uh, interactive database is the one where it shows people working in the US and you can see that historians live where people live and that often if you get your PhD say at the University of Chicago you might stay in Chicago right or Berkeley is the other one if you get your PhD at the, at the University of California Berkeley I guess people fall in love with the with the Bay Area and they don't leave right so you look at it and you begin to think aha people are making career choices not based exclusively on what they're studying or the, their degree they're making career choices based on their whole lives and that I think 
is something that we should draw attention to and affirm because you should make a career choice based on your entire life. It shouldn't be the only thing that you do. Um, the other, the other thing that I want to mention, and it overlaps with John Paul, so maybe it will be a bit of a segue. When we were starting, we talked to history PhDs who, who were working outside the academy, and we said, you know, what, what are you, what did you not learn in graduate school that you wish you had learned in grad school that would help you succeed? Out, you know, would have helped your transition to these careers that you have now, because that's what we heard. The transition was really hard. They made it; it was fine, but figuring out how to get those jobs and figuring out how to how to navigate was tricky because nobody there was nobody to talk to. And what we ended up with were five skills, which you can also see online at historians.org/five skills. Um, and one of the populations that we talked to were the ACLS public fellows, John Paul. So I think <laughs> people will understand why this was helpful. Um, but what we learned was that these skills are useful not just for succeeding outside the academy and in, in careers that, that John Paul and I have, um, but also that they are useful for succeeding inside the academy. And I'm happy to, as, as a, in a faculty position, so I'm, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about them, but I'll just list them briefly. I encourage you to look into them um, on the website. The five skills that you might not get in a history PhD program are communication, especially with uh, in diverse media to diverse audiences, collaboration, particularly with people who don't share your disciplinary commitments or your worldview, um, uh, quantitative literacy, which scares the pants off humanists, but is actually quite low. Um, the bar is quite low for that. Uh, intellectual self-confidence, which people are usually shocked at because they say, don't you get a lot of expertise with a PhD? And you do, but often it's very, it's very, uh, it's a small slice. And so the, the flexibility that Rebecca was talking about earlier is actually a, a sort of version of intellectual self-confidence saying, oh yeah, I'm, I'm not the world's leading expert, but I can learn. Um, and then the final one, which is not so much a separate skill as something that sort of runs through the other four is digital literacy. And that's just understanding I think now this is something that really goes without saying um, that you cannot live live and work in this world without understanding that some meetings happen on Zoom and budgets are done in Excel and a lot of communication happens on the web in social media and on blogs. Um, that email etiquette is real, you know. So all of these sort of things, um, all all of the skills have a digital component, and it's important for um, people to learn that. So I'll leave it there in the interest of time, but I'm happy to follow up with anybody afterwards. And I'll just jump in there briefly before we go to John Paul this, to say that that chimes exactly with Heather's comments about these things that she learned um, that were actually important for um, being a faculty member that, that you learned while being a graduate student leader. Um, that it struck me when you were talking about that. I was like thinking about the five skills. <laughs> I'll just um, add briefly to what um, to Emily's great overview of the work that AHA is doing. You know, ACLS is a is an organization that's made up of learned societies like the AHA, and we a lot of our activities in creating new initiatives, new programs, new funding opportunities um, for uh, emerging scholars is inspired by what our learned societies are learning from their members and what they're communicating up to us. Um, the AHA has been really at the forefront of this. The MLA has also done amazing work in thinking about cultural change within doctoral education, something that um, I think uh, gets back to the point that you just made, Rebecca, about the lack of transparency in, in uh, graduate education about why I'm, why am I learning this for what, or what's, you know, what are the skills that are actually going to be necessary for me to have a career inside or outside of the academy, because it's not made explicit at many moments in, in doctoral education. So just uh, the, the work that learned societies are doing to sort of name the skills, to, to catalog them, to give people vocabulary, to talk about um, what they're doing, why they're doing, why it has value is incredibly important. We've seen this in um, the ACLS for 10 years since 2010 has uh, ran this program called the Public Fellows Program. It's ongoing right now. Uh, we, have, we just named our 10th um, cohort uh, and uh, that has placed recent PhDs in, from every humanistic discipline in policy, media, uh, cultural, community organizations where they've done really fantastic work uh, on behalf of their, um, their organizations in um, international affairs and in, um, community engagement, in development and cultural development. And uh, what we've found is very much what 
Emily has found uh, through the work of the um, AHA that there are a lot of transferable skills and sometimes it's hard for, for people to name them, for people to actually say what they are and know how to deploy them. But what a few that we've learned um, are that um, humanities PhDs are really voracious readers. They are observers. They understand, they go into a new organizational context and they're reading, consuming every type of publication. They're reading the website. They're understanding um, the, the backgrounds. They're, they're looking at the board lists, the uh, board membership of the, their organizations and really doing the research, that habit of mind, that reflex to read a little bit more, to find out a little bit more of what's going on behind the scenes is something that really serves humanities PhDs well in various sectors beyond the academy. Um, they have um, expressive capacities. Sometimes they're narrowed as, as Emily uh, mentioned by practice, by, by working on a dissertation for such a long time, um, that the other kinds of communication that you, that might take for granted, teaching um, people who, non-specialist audiences, um, uh, engaging with other uh, parts of their lives in, in their communities, what, if they are embedded in a, uh, they feel connected to their communities. That is something that um, people take for granted and don't really feel like is a skill that, that is really valuable. It is. Um, and uh, one of the others that I, I just think the sort of cultural understanding and cultural sensitivities that um, uh, humanities PhDs bring with them the idea of understanding about difference, the, of understanding positionality um, is something that we see as part of a specialized work of humanities research, but it's something that is incredibly valuable outside of the academy as well, um, uh, that uh, employers have pointed out as really important for the work um, that the um, our public fellows have been great representatives for, for them uh, because they understand the, the context that they're entering into. Uh, that is um, uh, the sort of other side of the coin, the very real other side of the, the coin that um, Emily pointed out about the, the lacks of, of, of training and the lacks of experience explicit naming of the, the skills that you really need to develop that could be useful inside or the outside of the academy to really also own the skills that you are bringing to the table um, by dint of your your um, humanities education. And the last thing I'll say is that we're, we're seeing now, ACLS just launched a new program with the support of the Henry Luce Foundation, uh, the Leading Edge Fellowship, which uh, is a more rapid response program for recent PhDs to contribute to um, organizations that are trying to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic in their communities. Um, and they are, you know, across the, the country in many different contexts. And um, we're seeing that the, the skills when we ask them, so what would you need help with? What would you need someone to be able to do to help you with this project? They will name those things that um, I named. <laughs> they will um, also point to the the skills that Emily uh, named, and it, and the people who rise to the top of the this application process are those who have mastery of who can name the skills and are are, are able to demonstrate them in their materials. So um, thinking about rhetoric and communication, something that I hope humanities PhDs are good at. Um, thinking really. Um, intentionally about how they talk about what they've learned and how they can deploy them, it, uh, those skills without going into, ex, you know, an excessive or long um, excursus of, about their, their, the particularities of their research is something that has served humanities PhDs who are going outside of the academy very well. Thanks so much for those really thoughtful and, and wide ranging responses. Uh, one sort of quick follow up question that I had, and this is sort of directed both to Emily and John, but it really draws upon the experience of every member of the panel. One of the things we've we've heard in these stories is that there's um, the, the way in which the flexibility that has allowed, um, I think most of the panelists to have a career that's fulfilling has involved a, actually a considerable amount of international moving. And I think we have a number of people who are participating here today who are international students, who are struggling with the status of what it means to be an international student in the United States, nearing the ending of a, you know, the completion of a PhD program, concerned about their visa and figuring out how to, how to move forward. And so what, we, what we'd love to hear a little bit more about is um, how are institutions that are trying to help graduate students think about the challenges of moving out on the career 
you know, moving out out of the academy um, or or in continuing on in life in the academy, think helping students who are dealing with the very real problems that are increasing um, in, in the current climate um, of of basically managing being an international, you know, having an international visa in in the United States and beyond. Um, I'm that's an open question. To whoever would like to, who would ever would like to jump in. I'll just say very briefly that um, it, it, you're right that this is the difficulties around this particular issue have sharpened in recent years. Um, and I think one of the lessons I've taken away from working with um, people who are pursuing careers inside and outside of the academy after graduate school who are, who are not US citizens, or they're, they're looking to um, work in the US for some period of time, um, is about networks, um, is about uh, really um, thinking about campus networks and, and broader professional networks that there's so much help that happens by people who have you know, gone that path beforehand and really not um, trying to figure out everything yourself. Um, the really relying on campus resources uh, for uh, in the career center for thinking about what um, sort of OPT or other um, opportunities there are for, for um, limited, um, but, but work authorization that doesn't require a lot of heavy lifting on the part of an employer um, after, like that, there, it, is a, it is an arcane <laughs> um, uh, science and, and it's something that you should, that you're already super busy um, um, working on your, uh, of thinking about your career, you really need to rely on others for help to help untangle that um, as it is, of course, it's your own responsibility to, to meet all the deadlines and to, to um, file every form that you want, but really the, the, you should be turning to your university community and hopefully building up a network through your learned society. I would think that would be one place to do it, but also through LinkedIn and other, and, um, other career networks to, to follow the paths of people who have come from similar backgrounds and have, have um, made those transitions um, that you're looking to make. Yeah, the, the challenges facing international students has been something that we've known from the beginning is different when you're talking about careers, the fact of the minute that you finish your PhD, not only are you not getting paid anymore, but you maybe don't have a visa anymore that adds, that adds another layer of complexity. Um, so I would say the, the years that we've been working, everything John Powell said is exactly right. And so listen to him. Um, but the other thing to remember is that it, it's not an either or proposition. Uh, international students will say because of visa issues, you know, I can't get outside experience and I don't have time anyway because I have to be super A plus stellar on the academic job market because that's the only way I have a chance of getting to stay in the US if that's where I want to be. Um, but you need to remember that uh, that using graduate school to prepare for a range of outcomes actually isn't shutting you off from preparing for an academic career. If you're thinking about what you wanna do and gaining a diverse set of skills, you are actually also preparing to be a faculty member and to be competitive on the academic job market. Now, how to do that, again, is complicated in the US. Often international students can't work while they're a student that would jeopardize their visa. So for example, Try to, uh, some of the universities we've worked with have given course credit for an internship. So if you're trying to get experience doing something slightly different, you know, get, get, uh, get course credit rather than be paid. Um, you can use your status as a student to do things that might otherwise be beyond your reach. When you're a graduate student at XYZ University, you have opportunities and people see you in a special light. So find ways to, to uh, get involved and learn about things that you can't otherwise. You can learn just about anything at a university. That's the, that's the beauty of being on campus. Um, we call it use the whole university. Um, and then I think to, to just to underline what John Paul said, network, 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 network. And, and you know, be upfront about your visa status, but, and you know, it's a structural constraint. It, it is something that matters, but it's also just a structural constraint. So it's, it's, not, it's not insurmountable and it's not something that can keep you from exploring and finding a, a career that's fulfilling to you. Let me add something on visa because <laughs> So I kind of mentioned in passing that I defend my dissertation in the very end of August. I didn't go into detail, but I do think one piece of advice for international students is being sneaky about when you defend your dissertation. The reason I chose, it only worked for one year, but the reason I chose that particular timing was because it was the end. Uh, for Boston University, as far as the university concern, I, I already start new academic years. So I got a year of visa um, extension and I even got healthcare. So um, 
but then when I went on job market that year, the my second year, I even though I technically don't have my graduate, my diploma, but I already defend my dissertation in the end of August. So for almost all the job would, con would not consider me as ABD once you defend your dissertation. So th that's my understanding, at least in anthropology. So, so be sneaky about when you actually defend your dissertation. It will really only work for the very end of your state and your student visa in, in, in US. But if you tie the right, you can stay in US with student health care, <laughs> with a visa, but then you don't count as AVD. So that's, yeah, that, that, that's what I want to say. Well, I did want to just, maybe if we could just take um, a couple quick minutes to follow up to ask um, maybe um, Heather or Paul or Yape to talk a little bit about what it's like to sort of uh, deal with um, work culture or visa issues in the opposite direction when you're going from being a U.S. trained academic um, to uh, working in um, in or or um, Lucy as well, but getting um, a job outside of the U.S. and what that transition is like. I mean, obviously there are myriad issues involved, but um, if there's any um, particular piece of advice that you want to focus in on. Um, and maybe maybe one thing uh, you, in particular is, I think a lot of students now um, in a constrained job market are looking at things like um, postdoctoral fellowships, especially, or, um, um, uh, or lectureships. And the particularly in Europe, but also in Asia, the um, I think the landscape is quite different than in the United States where you have just like a lot more funded projects um, that, uh, that bring in a lot of researchers under the auspices of a particular um, uh, single researcher schema. Um, whereas in the US it's, it's more, you're, you know, people are used to working more independently. And um, a lot of graduate students that I talk to have a, have difficulty kind of envisioning themselves being, uh, you know, finding a place in someone else's um, project. Um, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about like how that works or how you have found made it work for you, perhaps. So this is actually a really good suggestion because there are a lot of postdoctoral fellowships, lectureships in Europe that are dependent on grant funding. And one of the things that you really have to do to succeed in Europe, and there are all sorts of you know, nuances to this, but one of the things is kind of being willing to be part of somebody else's research. Um, and this even goes for people who are applying for faculty positions in Europe, because one of the big kind of work cultural differences is that when you are an assistant professor in the Netherlands, for example, your supervisor is a full professor. So it's a little bit more like the assistant the misconception of an assistant professor as an assistant to the professor. Uh, and they can influence your research more than you would expect in say the United States, for example. Um, but that there are many, the EU funds many, many postdocs that come in and work on a project that's an opportunity to develop your skills. So for example, I consult on a project at Leiden still called the Open Philology Project that basically funds four or five postdocs for four years to work on this kind of very large scale project. Because another big difference being that humanities researchers in Europe are eligible for the same funding pots as natural science researchers. So you can get a 5 million euro grant to build a team and work on a project for multiple years. And so these people come together, they work on different aspects of this project, they acquire new skills, they do teaching, they do all sorts of things, but you have to kind of be willing to not be a, a PI on a project immediately. And so that can be difficult I think, for coming from an American context to fit yourself into, but it is, I think, a really, really valuable skill. And, you know, even as somebody who came in to work on my own stuff, I got involved in a lot of other projects and that really helped, I think, 
you know, acclimatize myself towards funding structures there and making sure that uh, when the time came, my position became permanent. Uh, another big difference being people often come in to permanent positions immediately rather than, you know, having a six, five or a six year tenure clock. So that would be another big difference. But the visa thing's an issue there. Um, as an American with um, an American uh, spouse, uh, that is tough because my wife is a biology PhD who wasn't interested in doing bench uh, like wet lab work. And so she was supposed to start a position at the State Department in 2016, but that fell through for various complicated political reasons. Um, and so she came to Europe instead, and it was very difficult as a non-European for her to find work. Uh, and we essentially returned to the U.S. because the job she found was with an American NGO that wanted her to transfer back to the U.S. I mean, there were lots of reasons for this, but one of the big ones was they wanted her to come back to D.C. And at that point, I kind of had to say, I'm essentially willing to exit academia if I can't find anything back in the U.S., or we have to figure out a way to stay to Europe. It's very complicated, but these are considerations and it kind of just goes back to what I think everybody here has been saying about, you know, it's important to be flexible. Um, and, it, you know, a big question is once you're off the market, out of academia, can you get back? And there's always a fear that you can't. Uh, but as Rebecca said, there's not necessarily a lot of evidence that you never can. So I was looking for positions like, you know, advising political campaigns and doing data science and these sorts of things that would let me be in DC close to where my wife worked. Um, but fortunately this William and Mary job came up and I got very, very lucky with that. Um, but it, it all kind of goes back to the difficulty in Europe for spouses um, if they're not European because there's a preference for Europeans and, and all of these sorts of things. But I encourage people to look for jobs there because it is a great place to be. One of the themes that keeps coming up is what does it mean to do collaboration? And Paul, your example, and uh, Rebecca, what you were asking sort of points to this other way of organizing thinkers, researchers, resources, et cetera, that maybe isn't so common in the humanities slash social sciences or the history side of, of social sciences in, in the US. And, um, that is something that I have found has been the most productive side of my collaborations in China. So there are several large uh, uh, um, NYU funded, but also other sort of loose grant funded projects that are about collaborative knowledge making. And some of it is specific to history, but the ones I've been so more excited about being part of are the ones that invite technologists into the conversation, um, especially students, uh, because I think one of, um, one, of, one of the things that I crave more of in history and more of in the humanities is a way to sort of maybe focus on uh, a topic or a question of common interest, but really sort of approach it from multiple disciplinary angles. So um, I run something called the Humanities Research Lab and it brings in, uh, really sort of data scientists and some computer scientists, as well as humanists to sort of co-share and co-research um, historical question related to 19th century immigration. But I think that is something I would advise to people uh, when they're looking for other opportunities is that, um, uh, you know, some of, some of, you know, asking other historians how they enter the job market or, or alt app jobs, is productive, but I think it's also been extremely important for me to learn about how other fields organize their resources. Like I've been really inspired by STEM and I think I've been really shaped by my time at MIT when I sort of see like, oh, there's this collaborative space that you come in and you talk about the problems every day and that's really productive. Why do we close our doors to our offices? We really need a shared space. So these kinds of realizations of like how other fields do things is, something I would encourage people to be open to, not that it solves precarity, but it's another way to sort of think about, you know, um, different, different skills that, I, I, I've been reading sort of the comment section and I, I, I hear the anxiety, I hear the concerns and um, 
I don't, I don't have any solutions to those large structural things. And I apologize for, you know, not having, um, you know, I, I can't offer comfort in that answer, but I guess my, my point is that sticking to a narrative of what academia should be or what even a faculty position looks like um, um, may be more narrow and limiting than, um, it might be closing some doors, I guess is what I'm saying. So if you sort of crack open that a little, crack open what you think of is a faculty position or what is, um, you might see more opportunities than closed doors. Maybe I just uh, respond a little bit to uh, what Paul said about his experience in the Netherlands, because I think both of us actually uh, based our, our based our European experience on this one nation, and. Uh, my understanding, or just to add to his comment about uh, spouse uh, 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 possibility for, for academic spouse to get a job here. My understanding is that in terms of the legal uh, stipulation in Europe, uh, academic spouse, if the if if one person actually gets a permanent job or structural job, the freedom for the spouse to work is actually bigger. So basically, in the U.S., I, my understanding is a lot of times the spouse uh, uh, is not allowed or are not allowed to work uh, either part time or full time. In the US, I mean, in Europe, there's no such limitation. And therefore, you know, but of course in Europe, the language barrier is a huge issue. And if you are in more professional, uh, uh, professionally licensed uh, fields, for example, nurses or uh, school teachers, lawyers, that barrier will be really, really high. You pretty much have to go through all the examinations again in order to be able to practice. But uh, because I actually first arrived here as a spouse and that's why it's my experience. And secondly, about research. Actually, I mean, when I was thinking about this, I mean, in preparation for today's panel, when I think about so-called research in, the, uh, in, uh, in, in my work environment, a lot of times this term actually in the area of research, it, it's, it's more, research is more about money and more about getting grants and big, more about getting big grants because universities, the basic function of university is uh, education. So whatever research grant that a faculty member can receive from the outside funding uh, agents is extra financial help for the university. So whenever we are talking about research, actually the administrators are talking about fund application and getting big grants. But in within the structure of university as a permanent member, permanent staff, you also have uh, resources and support for research, that's actually more following your individual uh, desire. So I have, it's in my contract, 40% of my, uh, my resource or resources or salary or my work time, 40% is for research. And I can use this to argue for lower teaching load and say my teaching load is actually more than 60% now and it's unfair. And so there's certain, uh, so for this kind of uh, so-called like a research area, and it's basically there are different pockets and different ways of negotiate, negotiating that. So uh, that, so just like two notes on that. If I could just jump in very quickly, uh, I, I think Yape says, you know, precisely how it is. My visa said I have to work for a university, but my wife who came as a spouse said she could work anywhere, but the problem was she was looking for very kind of high level professional positions. 
without having Dutch, it's very, very difficult. I think there are probably a lot of um, uh, faculty, US-based faculty members who are extremely envious of this, being able to negotiate for research time <laughs> based on uh, teaching over extension right now. And sorry, Rebecca, I just want to add, we are very envious for sabbatical. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have sabbatical uh, break yeah. at all. Yeah. Yeah. As a result of the financial situation of American universities that um, the interest in, um, in faculty members in the humanities and humanistic social sciences getting large research grants in the US is going to um, shift um, as we go on. But I would be remiss, the discussion of collaboration um, in the humanities, I would be remiss um, in this Kogut Institute sponsored event, not to mention that one of the features of, of that institute is a graduate um, program in the collaborative humanities. Um, so, uh, which is um, started off as collaboration um, between um, different uh, uh, units or faculty from different units in the humanities, but it's now really featuring um, undergraduate instruction and graduate instruction um, between uh, faculty in, in um, for instance, in STEM and the humanities. So it really is developing in those ways, which is exciting to see, but um, um, I, there's a lot, to, a lot left to do, obviously. The first question, I mean, I think one of the things that all, um, all of you have, have demonstrated is um, the Im importance of um, the way the way that precarity has been with us all along. And I think a number of the questions deal with how about right now? How about 2020? How is COVID changing things right now? And two specific questions that came out of that is one is uh, one of one of our attendees was quite struck by uh, Yape's perception about the problem of getting on and off the academic track. And they're curious to know if if you think that it will be easier to make those movements on and off the track or perhaps in and out of different countries in a post COVID era, will selection committees be more accommodating of unconventional pathways? And then another question that's related is um, how do you, you know, do, what, are, what are your thoughts or how might you, we address the situation of untenured faculty whose academic positions may be threatened by COVID related cuts of positions or even whole programs, and if you have if you have thoughts on that. Well, let me jump in on the on the untenured professors, uh, and I have a sort of two pronged answer. One is if you do think your position or the department is under threat, and and we know that that is that is in play in in 2020. The the use your use your learning society use the AHA. That's part of our job is to advocate for the study and learning of history, and then you know whatever other learning society you might belong to. Um, if, if you are a historian, it's best to route that through your department chair because that they, we can't really do anything without the department chair being on board. So, you know, um, but we have written letters on behalf of departments, but they're not always public. So we're also welcome, we, you know, we welcome the opportunity to, to negotiate or have a back channel conversation. We can help you with that. We can help you in conversations with your, with your administrators. So one, go to your learning society. But two, I think the other thing behind that question is what if, you know, that's fine, but what if that doesn't happen? What am I gonna do with my career now? Because I could be, I could be lost. I could have to do something else. And I think the answers that we've been given throughout really apply in that situation. You know, think about what it is that you want to do with your life. Think about what, there's a really great tool called Imagine PhD. Um, which allows you to, to inventory, they break it into uh, three, three inventories, your skills, your values, and your interests, and then they align them with job families. And one of them is faculty, right? So they're not saying you have to do something else, but that's a really useful tool for thinking about um, what, how, would you, how you would like to spend your time and how you can align your, your skills, values, and interests. You shouldn't feel that the only thing, um, that there's nothing fulfilling in the world other than being a faculty member. I mean, hopefully you won't lose your job. You have this job that presumably you like and you want to keep. And so, you know, best case scenario that doesn't happen. But I think all of us right now are trying to figure out what this world looks like and sort of, you know, evaluating uh, what, what our career paths look like. If I could jump in, uh, kind of related to this issue of changing expectations because of COVID, 
I mean, I think we're just in such uncharted territory right now that it's so hard to know what's going to happen. But I think it's kind of incumbent on hiring committees to really take this into consideration. And, you know, this is a concern for those of us who are coming up for tenure in the next year or two. You know, we can't get our books published right now. We can't go to archives. We can't really, and, you know, plug the other uh, sessions of this series. You should check those out too. Um, but I think it's really important for hiring committees to, to be thinking about this and to understand that everybody and particularly early career people, uh, women, uh, people who are already underrepresented in academia are affected by COVID far more than many of us who are privileged to be in tenure track positions. You know, white men have it easier than anybody else. These are all things that we are going to have to come to grips with over the next few years. And they're such big structural issues that I think we need to be having them in these broad, you know, cross institutional contexts. I, it's not actionable advice and I'm sorry for that, but I, I, hope we can, I hope we can look out for those who are coming up behind us. One of the, one of the questions that we have um, picks up, I think on the theme that Emily was just talking about, about how we might how we might push our institutions to um, maybe maybe individual faculty members don't have the power to have the kind of impact on selection committees that Paul's talking about, but nonetheless we do have um, certain capacities that we can mobilize to 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 push our institutions to help create new positions or help to sustain the positions that are already there. Um, one specific question that we had um, pertained to this in, in terms of digital humanities. Um, one of our attendees asked, "I'm a PhD student interested in digital humanities." I mean, many, many colleagues are interested in this kind of thing as well. How do I get my department to help push this kind of work, especially when such a department or center does not exist in our university? So I think this is posed in a digital humanities, as a digital humanities question, but I think it's actually a much more general question of what have you done successfully to, to mobilize your departments, um, to mobilize the local institutions in which you're located to, to do important work? And that's, again, an open question to everyone. I should apologize, I don't want to dominate the conversation, but this is something that I have a lot of direct experience in. Um, when I started getting into DH, my institution had absolutely no, they had like one maybe class for the English students, but you know, the Chinese studies didn't really have anything involved in DH. And so it was very lonely kind of trying to get out into these spaces and learn things. Um, and I had to turn a lot to online tutorials and these sorts of things, but um, what I've done since then is try to develop curricular materials that they that other people can take advantage of because I I really don't want other people to have to deal with that. Uh, but one way is you know try to seek local funding to establish workshops to start classes to really say hey there's an interest in this uh, what can you do to you know facilitate this as a graduate student you know, get your friends together who are interested in this and go to your department chair and say, you know, there's call for this. W what can you do to help us? I was also <laughs> really struck by, uh, Heather, what you were saying earlier about the way in which working in a new institution has forced you to figure out on the fly how to solve all sorts of new problems. I wonder if you might have, have, have thoughts on the the sort of the, I don't know, the social or micro institutional dynamics of, of how one goes about how one goes about doing that. I guess the first piece to that is learning how your institution and how your unit within the wider ecology of the institution functions. So um, NYU Shanghai is not a place I realized when I started was uh, most of the major decisions happen at the top in the sense that we don't have strong faculty governance or there isn't there aren't those clear lines that where more established institutions say you know this decision gets made at this level then it gets passed up at that level and because we don't have those structures in place a lot of it stands you know a little bit higher up so i think it's sort of figuring out and that is not necessarily a bad thing i think the fact the fact that there is a you know there's three people that I go to for things and I know exactly who they are and I have a relationship to them. So those are learning to navigate those things and then figuring out how to 
Um, I think find a space within an evolving, a fast, a quickly evolving institution. I think this was, if anybody is interested in American-like institutions in Asia, this characterizes a lot, especially a lot of the new ones, um, the ones in Singapore, the other ones in China that have been recently um, established is that it's kind of, we're trying to figure out what does it mean to do liberal arts in East Asia? Um, and what does it mean to like, you know, teach a population that is not going to be necessarily coming from, um, with, with a different sort of uh, sense of classroom conduct. So I think it means that we do a lot of policy making as, um, as we see the needs come up. For example, um, with Black Lives Matter this summer, I started um, a, a diversity initiative that, um, because there's nothing of the sort on the ground for um, uh, faculty or staff. Um, so it's uh, evolving and it's those things where you kind of, um, and I think this happens in any institution, but I think it's, uh, for me, it's been sort of, uh, uh, surprising to learn what's missing as I adjust to teaching in a new country, in a new environment, and in an institution that it's still defining itself. Um, so um, I think that uh, policies and program made on the spot may not always be the best things out of the box, but we kind of do what we can and we do with what's there and we adjust along the way. So that is, I guess that's that's one example of, of something that I, um, uh, you know, just trying to figure out what my space is in, in this institution. I just wanted to, to follow up on um, the question about how, how what we're doing right now might lead um, some solutions for the longer term, the, the broader question. And when Rebecca invited um, me to participate, I was really like, I love the 2020 and beyond question, because I'm really looking forward to the beyond. Um, uh, and I'm really looking forward for 2020 to be over. But I do think that I've seen a lot of really interesting changes due to the pandemic in people's work, um, in the way people are collaborating remotely, um, uh, in the way that people are um, opening up projects that might have really been for no reason, good reason at all, conceived of as local projects or departmental or institutional projects and saying, if, if people from my institution are um, remoting in from anywhere in the world, why can't we have other people from other institutions doing that? And so just to the, the point about um, digital humanities projects, many of which are really collaborative, um, really signing up for, for the sort of pan DH list serves like DH now and, and, and going onto the Haystack communities to look at what's going on there. You may find that there are more opportunities now than there ever have been before to um, join projects and to, to get some experience and to learn what people are working on there. Learned Society meetings are also another place where a lot more remote participation is happening and by necessity because the, the conferences aren't happening in person. And I've seen some really interesting um, opportunities for remote mentorship that might not have been actually on the surface of Learned Society meetings in the past, um, and not all Learned Society meetings, but that um, uh, finding ways to have uh, asynchronous um, content and synchronous um, collaboration. I I'm really impressed by what's happening this year, and I really hope that it continues on into the future because there are a lot of, despite all the awful things of 2020, there's a couple of things that I think have been really liberating. And I hope for people who are at under-resourced in DH departments or schools um, are looking outward um, uh, and, and uh, petitioning their learned societies and their institutions or other institutions to keep them in mind. Quickly, I'm not so sure this is, uh, this is I mean, this is just my um, very tentative observation that I noticed that a lot of colleagues in the US actually are facing uh, kind of like a shrink, quickly shrinking uh, job market at this moment. And I just want to say that in uh, continental Europe, I haven't seen that happening. Uh, at, one, at my own institution, uh, because everything is switching online, uh, there's a very prominent uh, discourse and notification, mean, at, at least a notice that how much our workload has increased. 
And therefore, uh, instead of cutting back jobs, all the uh, vacancies, actually uh, the, the, the pressure to fill the vacancy is higher than before. And uh, that's one, so I'm not sure whether that says anything about long-term. And another area of possible uh, job opening is actually in the UK because of Brexit. So in the past two or three uh, years, we noticed, uh, uh, I just recently moved to uh, Ireland and because the market is very close connected, I just noticed that uh, in uh, the UK and in, in, in Ireland, uh, because everybody, understand economically how uh, much worse uh, the, the conditions are at this moment. It's considered kind of a, not a desirable market, but exactly because of that, uh, they need more uh, people from outside of their own uh, system. And uh, so we might be uh, getting into a situation that uh, that uh, 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 graduate students will need to kind of like keep in mind about this over overseas market uh, opportunities. And actually, the discussion of the overseas market opportunities, I think, really um, leads segues quite nicely to the final question that we have. One of the attendees asked, I, I think, an aspect to consider in the current time is that we are going through a pandemic plus a political climate that is not very welcoming for international students from a governmental perspective. And I think that actually touches to a much broader issue of um, if we're going to have the flexibility, if we're encouraging students to have the flexibility to pursue jobs globally, that also implies that they're going to be moving into and through a variety of different political contexts and working for institutions that, um, that they may not necessarily have a democratic stake in. Um, and so it sort of touches on, I think, a much broader and deeper question. This is really an unfair question to ask, but there's only three minutes left for conversation. But I know Rebecca and I were, were very curious to hear just a, a few brief, brief thoughts on the challenges that um, people who are finishing their PhDs today, um, you know, I think how they, might, how they might deal with the challenges of balancing their ethical commitments with their material needs. Um, I think, uh, you know, ethical, moral considerations have always been fundamental to the work that we are doing in the academy. This particular moment is causing an intensification or intensification of re-examination of what those ethical commitments are. And I think a lot of the students out there are deeply committed to not reproducing some of the injustices of the past. And so, um, but in an age of precarity, it's very hard to have the leeway to feel like one can actually have those strong commitments or to work through them. And so, so I, just as a final sort of closing set of questions or, you know, if, if you have any thoughts on that, that you might like to share about how students can think about that balancing, I think that would be, that would be terrific. I'll jump in and give another plug for Imagine PhD. It's a really fantastic tool for thinking about what your skills and values and interests are. And values, I think, is the important one here in this ethical consideration. Um, a lot of people assume or think that, you know, everything inside the academy is virtuous and everything outside the academy is a vicious rat race. And that binary just doesn't hold, right? There are people, good people doing good work outside of the academy. And there's some nasty rat race inside the academy, right? So it, it pays to sort of think about what you want to do and, and what your values are and how they might align with your skill set and, and how you want to spend your life. Um, and that that requires just doing some some self-study and thinking about what your what your path looks like. But the it, you should never have to choose between the line I always come back to is you should never have to choose between the values that brought you to graduate school and what you do after graduate school. They should, you should be able to connect them. And it might not be ideal, right? You might find yourself in a situation one time when you're, you're, you're working one job to pay the bills and you're looking to do something else, but you shouldn't see that as a selling out or, or, or giving up. Um, everybody has to make choices to make their life work and there's no, there's no right or wrong way to do that, I guess is, is what I would say. A lot, a lot of people do have, have real um, they feel really caught, as you've said, Jeffrey, and I, and I want to sort of give people the freedom and the agency to say, you don't have to feel caught between a rock and a hard place, um, even though this is, a, this is a rock and a hard place moment. And maybe to put some specificity on it, we did have a, a question just come in about 
um, how this affects uh, students within East Asian studies particularly. So um, I wonder if anybody has any thoughts about how this plays out um, in, um, for, Asian, for Asianists um, with any specificity. I'll jump in and just say that um, when I talk to people who study, especially especially Asia, uh, Asia Asian Asianist historians, they often assume that all of this advice doesn't apply because they don't study U.S. history, and so what they're learning isn't useful in the U.S. Um, but I would say that's not true. A lot of what we've talked about is not content specific. And additionally, if you study Asia, you have a skill that a lot of other historians and humanists don't have, which is you have at least one language. You probably have more than other, more than one. And that opens a door of, of possibilities to you that is closed to a lot of other people. And so I think doing an inventory in that way where you think about what you have access to. And I think John Paul said the sort of cultural, uh, um, cultural fluencies that you bring to an organization, they're, they're even more than, than others might. Very useful advice. And I, um, in a way that the, um, the sort of uh, contingencies of the moment are extremely unfortunate, but I really, I value them for bringing Asianists into this conversation in greater numbers and with more attention than maybe have been in the past because of this feeling of like, well, we're always the exception in some way, shape or form. Um, and so, um, so I think that that, that, that is, is quite useful. And it's not necessarily an, um, in this sort of negative way, either, but sort of in the collaborative way that, um, that um, Heather spoke of. Um, so we've gone past 1045. I've held some of you very late. Um, I've delayed others from breakfast or lunch, um, but we still, we have, um, you know, a good uh, 25 people hanging on in the audience. Um, so um, thank you all so much for, um, coming, sharing your experience, uh, your wide experience, which is I think really the key here um, is to, to think of ourselves as rounded human beings um, instead of um, disembodied brains is sort of how I feel that a lot of graduate training <laughs> in, the, in the past has, has kind of treated people. Um, uh, Paul very kindly wrote in the chat that he is um, he is happy to um, to receive um, emails if people um, have further questions. Um, I'm happy also to um, to be in contact with people and um, if um, people in the audience have follow up questions to um, try to put you in contact with others who um, who either on this panel or elsewhere who who may be able to answer. Um, so thank you all so much for, um, for attending. Um, Emily has also just provided her, her email address. Um, thank you all. Um, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Rebecca and Jeffrey and all the panelists. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rebecca and Jeffrey and all the panelists. <laughs>